Welcome everybody to part two of our three-part bird drawing series with John Laws. I'm Hamar from Richardson Bay Audubon and I'm uh, glad to show you some of the artwork that our class members have produced from the last class, How to Draw Garden Birds, and John is going to take it away and get started on how to draw water birds. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's really good to see all of you with us again. I am really delighted with the uh, with with two things. Um, just the, the the diversity and this is important. The quantity of 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 work that has has spilled in. There's absolutely wonderful bird sketching going on, and it's just it's blossoming all over the place. It's really, really important to remember that this is, it's essentially a numbers game. You got to throw in your pencil miles. And once you do, you're going to see, I'm looking at the bird and it's starting, it's starting to kind of look like what I'm, what I'm seeing. And the more you do it, the better it gets. So if you are starting at a place where you are, you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm new to this. This is, this is, this is really challenging. Um, those pencil miles, you're going to see at the start a really big jump um, in the, your ability to see and get that down on the paper. And if you've been drawing for a longer time, then what's going to happen is you, are, you also look for these big steps up in your ability to see the bird and get it down on the paper. This is not Drawing birds is not about having some gift or talent. It's really putting in time, observing, and putting marks on paper. The more that you do that, the better and better and better it's going to get. And what we're seeing with all of these bird sketches that have been shared online is a, is a, is a wonderful kind of testament to that. Um, you probably saw that in some of your own sketches, the, the ones towards the end, um, actually, often the ones right before the end are probably going to be your, um, your better sketches. They have the feeling of the bird uh, a little bit more easily. The ones at the start were just warming up. The ones at the very, very end, sometimes people feel pressure like, now I've got to like, make a really good one. And so we tighten up and we kind of like, we lose it there. But very often the ones like right before the end, take a look through your sketches and just, just notice if you saw that change. It's some of those you kind of look down and like, yeah, that really, that really has kind of the feeling for the bird. Today, we are going to be looking at, at drawing sh um, shorebirds and waterfall. And the, the thing that's really great about drawing these critters is they hang out right in front of you. And if you're looking at songbirds, they're gonna, they'll pop up, do their little song, and then they're disappeared into the bush. And if you're drawing something like a kinglet, good luck, because they're just constantly on the move. And then here's the leaf, here's the bird. You can't see it because they're hiding somewhere in that bush. The duck will not hide behind the leaf. Isn't that great? So the duck is just out there. And then it turns. And then it goes back. So, I mean, it's, they'll just give you all these views and they're not hiding behind leaves. And shorebirds are the same way. They will be right out there on the water's edge and you can roll up, you can watch them. They're not, they're not hiding. Um, so I, I like to say um, they can, um, uh, they can they run, but they, they, they will not hide. So we're going to start off with the shorebirds, and then we're going to go into ducks, um, geese, and swans. And um, I think you're going to find some tricks here that are really, really useful for drawing those, those groups. Essentially, the drawing tricks and strategies which we were using before for songbirds, we're going to be using those again here. But um, there's there's a few things that are that that deserve a little bit more time. Um, there are going to be some interesting things going on with necks, and we'll take a really careful look at that. Legs too. 
And other than that, we'll just be reviewing those fundamental skills which we developed before, and, and this will be good. But we're gonna start off with pet the bird. Are you ready? Here we go. So you're out there at the marsh, and a little avocet pops up in front of you, and you want to draw it. What I find is the most helpful area to focus on right at the start is this, look at, don't look at the avocet here, look at the shape of the air behind its back. This is what artists call a negative shape, a negative shape. And, and what is going on here is that when you are focused on drawing the bird and you're looking at the bird, like feather, 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 oh my gosh, I've got an eye, I have to put the eye in the right place, all that sort of stuff. There's so much detail that your brain it, your brain gets locked on those details. But at the start, the most essential thing to get is the, the posture, the feeling of this bird. And the best way to get that is by not looking at the bird, is looking at the shape of the air next to the bird. Notice how when you are looking at this blue-gray area back here, you can see this contour this coming down the head to a little bit of a point, slight roll off here and then straight down here. You can see that shape better. Now take your eyes and focus on the bird and notice that you're, the, you're really distracted by birdness. Now bring your eyes back to the negative shape. And now what I want you to do is we're gonna pet the bird. So you, everybody at home, and just imagine people across the world doing this all right now, together. Put your hand on the top of the head of the bird. And I want you to just Run your hand down the back, feel where it that hits the, the neck, hits the back, and then down the bird. And I want you to pet the bird several times. And you're, you're doing is you're kinesthetically, yeah, no, really, you too. I'm watching you. You pet the bird, pet the bird. All right. So what you're doing is you're kinesthetically picking up a sense for, I'm going to have a line that comes down like this, line comes this. Another variation of pet the bird is do it with a pencil in your hand and feel around the back of the bird and then down the back. But it's a little bit more kind of intimate when you're kind of, you just are gonna pet the bird. But, so you're gonna curve around the back and then down. So do that several times. That is this essential first shape. And so at the start, sometimes if I'm, I'm out there in the field, I've got my, my spotting scope set up or um, my binoculars, I'll brace my binoculars on one knee and I will be physically in the, in the air petting the bird or doing this. And sometimes I'm even talking out loud. If as you're watching the bird, you're speaking out loud what you're seeing, right? So it's gonna come down then, then, then really straight down, little bit of a nook in, out, straight and down. So what you're doing is you're, you're, you're talking way around it. So a little bit down of an angle, then straight down, little bit of a nook in, rounded top, straight, slight angle change, Slate. So you're going to talk your way through each of these changes in the angle of the line. If you verbalize that, it helps your brain wrap around the idea that, look, there really is a slight angle change right here. And then what happens, your brain notices it because you've said it out loud, it's going to register this better. And then whoop, you are on to the... Um, you're, you're, you're much better able to get that down in your, this, in, in your drawing. So let's try this again. We're going to pet the bird. So everybody pet the bird. So just first kinesthetically feel that. Where does it curve and come up? Is there, are there inflection points? Is it, is it all a gentle curve? Are there places where there's more of an inflection point in that? where more curviness is happening. So there's a lot of curve of change. You could think of that as a straight line. That is a straight line to there. That is a straight line to there. Those junctures between what could be straight lines, those are your inflection points in that curve. And you want to get your brain to notice those and you're gonna wrap yourself around it. This is a little curlew here. So pet the curlew, everybody at home, pet the curlew. Now start talking your way around it out loud, out loud wherever you are. I'm gonna be quiet. Everybody verbalize wrapping around those inflection points.
it turns out that verbalizing your observations when you are out there in the field is an incredible way to get yourself to remember more details. Many times I've had the experience, I'm looking at the bird, I'm looking at the bird and I think, okay, I've got it now and I go to draw it. You look down at your piece of paper, as this happened to you? You look down at your piece of paper and your brain has gone blank. Like, ah, uh, ah, uh, and you look back at the other yeah, bird's still there. And then you, you, it's to get stuff to stick in your brain better, say it out loud, right? It's a, it's a, uh, a phenomenon called the production effect. If you verbalize things, your brain is going to stick with those in a much more significant way than if you're just looking at it. And you're thinking, but no, I'll scare the bird away. No, you're not. You're not gonna scare the curlew away. Um, the, if, if you're right next to a bird in the bush and it's like right there, okay, I probably wouldn't talk. Right, but otherwise you can get just in a normal kind of low tone of voice like this. But talk, talk, talk. You can you can talk your way around your observations, and it takes some getting used to because you know people think that only crazy people talk to themselves. But you're you're talking to the bird. You're just you're verbalizing. Right, my your your head comes down and there's a little curve, not a sharp point, little curve, then up, um, and I'm feeling it with my hand. Then then down, not flat, at a slight angle down, then long turn, okay? So you, you say that, you're then gonna be able to get it down on your piece of paper. So my first line, my first line when I am drawing these birds is that pet the bird line, all right? I pet the bird, and then there's my pet the bird line, all right? So I pet the bird, and this is a, this is a different bird, um, this will be a, a sketch of, I'm going to build up kind of a sketch of a, 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 a curlew here. Um, but that's, that's number one. Let's just kind of go back to that again. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to notice how big is that bird's head. The useful rule of thumb, again, is that big bird, small head, small bird, big head. So proportionate to its body, how big is that head? And look at this. This bird has a pretty dinky little head. There's a little tiny head up there, great big body, big head. I mean, small head, big body. All right, so that <clears throat> is going to be my second line. So what I do is I'm going to take this, this back line and I'm going, to put, um, I'm going to put a head on it and I'm not gonna make my head too big. I tend to make my head too big. Go through a bunch of your sketches and notice if you're a big header or a small header. And there probably will be a general rule that in your sketchbook you kind of be like, oh yeah, I'm making all my heads too big, or I'm making all my heads too small. And then you can correct for that, just sort of knowing what your habit is. And then it'll, so, but for me, I have to watch against heads that are too big. Cause I just think your body, your brain tends to draw things too big that are interesting. So now, um, actually, I'm gonna do a little experiment here. I'm gonna bounce back before I kind of go through this whole process. Why don't we try this? Just everybody draw the curlew. Let's just take two minutes, and I'm gonna do it too. Um, two minutes to draw the curlew. All right. Let's go do that now.
So no, actually, I don't want people. Uh, I need to go back to this this sharing function. Um, I'm going to. I, I want people not looking at my drawing for this. I want people looking at the bird. So behind the scenes, I think we. So I'm going to put this this bird back here. So don't don't worry about what I'm doing. There's everybody on your own. Um, let's draw this bird. About uh, 20 seconds left. I'm not giving you time to do a lot of drawing. I just want you to get some sort of notice. All right. So um, I'll, I'll kind of come to why I had everybody do that uh, in, in just a moment. We're going to be doing, getting a lot of, of time practicing sketching birds today. But um, that, that first one, I uh, wanted to kind of give you a chance just to sort of notice how you would approach blocking this in. Um, and then kind of go back to, for me, I put that frame on the back and then give myself a head. From there, I feel the tummy of the bird. And I'm going to be doing the same thing where I'm going to look at what are the negative shapes right here on the front of the bird. So if you remember when we were drawing the songbird, we had, we, we uh, took that approach of, um, I first draw the line of the back and then um and then i drew in the head gave myself the line put in the line around the chest and then dropped in the ball of the ball here this is the same thing it's just that these negative shapes here really are going to demand your attention and your and your your love a little bit more all right, so that negative shape put in the head, that negative shape. And what that does is it makes a little receiver place, a little catcher's mitt for that ball of the body. When I'm putting in this ball of the body, that's where I'm really, for myself, thinking about how, how big is this body compared to the head? So. At this, when I was putting in my head, I was thinking of proportions a little bit, but now I'm really, really dialing into, I want to get the body size to be right for my, my head size. If I'm drawing something like a little sanderling, a little sandpiper, it's gonna have a really large head relative to that body. But if I've got my curlew here, then it's gonna be a small head relative to that body. So at this stage, that's where I'm really kind of dialing in on that. From here, I'm going to put in my beak. And notice the way that I'm putting in this beak is with two straight lines rather than a curved line. The reason that I do that is that when I am drawing a curve, um, my brain gets so wrapped around like, a, oh, it's got a curved beak that I start really exaggerating that curve. This, this bird has a, um, 
it has a beak that comes out fairly straight and at towards the end is where the curve part comes in. So I'm just giving myself a, I, I wanna know where in that bill is the inflection point where that curve starts to happen and to prevent me from overdoing that, one, one thing you might look at your, your drawing of the curlew is notice if your curlew has this long sickle bill curve starting all the way from the start. That's our brain going, wrapping around like, oh my gosh, it's got a curved bill. And so I've got to, you just, you, you overdo that curve. But if I start with my beak coming out straight and then I can start to figure out where in that bill that, that curve happens, that's gonna help me be able to to, to get that curve more accurately. For the legs, this is the way that I start. I put in a little line showing how far down the ground is. And then another little line here where its ankle is. So we'll be talking about that sort of weird backwards facing joint you, you see sticking down on, the, on, on shorebirds. That's not a backwards facing knee. We'll kind of show you some skeletons in a moment. That's where the ankle is. So that when I am putting in my legs, they'll come down to that line. I'll put in my ankle and then the rest of the foot from there. There may be, and in this case there is, there may be more leg that is down this way, but this is just where my water surface is. So you don't have to be able to see the part of the legs that you can't see, like, oh no, how far down should I make this? I can't see that. I would just draw in the water where you see it. So if it's wading around at, with water at this height on its legs, you've actually learned something interesting about that word. This is where the bird wades. Do different birds wade at different heights on their legs? You can find out through your direct observation. So you're capturing that information in your sketch. A couple of other little angles that I find very useful. One, just up. What is the shape of the feathers where the, under, on the underside of the belly, these are the undertail coverts in here where the belly feather comes in, the undertail coverts. And I also will often intentionally look at the angle of the forehead. So you see a lot of similarities here between this and drawing the songbirds. There's that angle of the forehead. That is really important. And once I have this framework, so this is gonna be a big jump. Um, if I've done it lightly, I can, will draw my, I'll stop drawing loose and sketchy and I can start to be more precise and deliberate. And this is where your drawing of your bird, and we'll kind of get into some of these details in a moment. Um, but this careful, precise drawing goes on top of that, that, that scaffolding that you had already created. Again, it doesn't matter how many curlew details you put into your, your drawing. If you have the proportions of a wimbrel, it's not gonna feel like a curlew. If you have the proportions of, of a spotted sandpiper, it's really not gonna feel at all like a curlew. So getting, taking time at the start of a drawing to block in these basic shapes, is really important. Just a few reminders. Start by pet the bird, pet the bird, get that shape in the back. That's going to be a, it's, it's the wire on which you hang the head and the body. So that's your most important life. And something that's neat about that is as the bird is doing different poses and postures and things, you're going to see that line move around very dynamically. So as the bird is doing a different activity, that line is gonna change. So with your first line, you're also kind of getting the energy, the motion, the, the pose of this bird, critical for getting that, all right? So now we're gonna practice this. Here's a bird, and what we're all going to do is I'm going to, we're gonna take one minute and we're going to block in this basic shape of the bird. Um, as you, uh, <clears throat> as we, we do this, I am going to jump over to my little camera here. And I just want to, to, to show you um, kind of the energy of, of doing a drawing like this. It's not going to be like this. It, you're not going to draw, here is the back of the head of my bird. It then comes out flat, 
and down. See how I'm kind of just moving slowly, carefully? That's not the energy for these, these first lines. What your, your energy is gonna be is like this. So I'm making lots of lines, right? If you make one careful, deliberate line, even if it's not in the right place, your brain is going to say, oh, yeah, good job. That's, that's the right place um, because there's one deliberate line there. If I've got several – see how I first made my beak too high here? Because I'm – if I had gone – like that, my brain would say, oh yeah, this line is in the right place. But now, then I, but because I made it sketchy, I'm, it's much easier for my brain to switch over and um, be able to, 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 to get, uh, to, to, to change my mind, to say that that's not where my, my, my beak should be pointing. Right. So you see that this is, it's, it's fast, it's loose. There's a lot of lines being put down there. And then once, that's, that's the energy that you're going to want. As you do this, your brain is going to try to make you draw slow. Because you're thinking, if I draw slow, then I'm going to make fewer mistakes, right? But when you're drawing slow and careful and precise like that, that's, that's the energy for later on in the drawing. But at the start, you want, you really want this loose gestural, this loose gestural thing. You, so you're, you're making a lot of lines, not that one. All right, so now, we're gonna jump back to our first bird here. Here it is. This is a willet in breeding plumage. So, super fast, make a sketch. You're gonna get about one minute here. About 10 more seconds. All right. So again, for, for a bird like this, you want to get, you want to get that sort of fast, sketchy energy. I'm going to switch up the bird here. All right. And we're going to, Give you one more minute here. Before we do, I want everybody, before you're worried about drawing the bird, I want everybody to pet the bird. So just at home, feel around that nice head down straight to the neck, up rather steeply onto the back, rather flat. Notice where there's that inflection point in here where you're starting to come down. So kind of flat and down here, right? Get those inflection points here, maybe here. Where would you put the inflection points around that curve? Definitely there, all right? But pet the bird a couple of times, pet the bird. All right. Then let's, um, so I'm, I'm gonna ask 
that uh, we're, we're not going to, we're going to keep it on this big screen, not um, zooming into to, to my separate screen. So because this is what I want everybody working from. Um, let's go to sketch that bird now. All right, you're going to have one minute. And stop. All right. <sighs> All right. Now, take a breath. Drop your shoulders. Relax. And we're going to try this bird. Just a couple things to notice about it. This beak is actually coming out straight. You get out to here, and then there's an inflection point in here. So on drawing this beak, I would draw it as a straight line. And then somewhere in that, I would put a little line coming diagonally down from that. So you don't have to, don't even first worry about kind of stopping the straight line in the right place. So I'd have a line that says your beak basically goes like this. And then towards the end, here's my second line, kind of cutting across that. Don't look at the bird for a second. Just look at the shape of the green water here. And what we're going to do on our pieces of paper is I want you to stare at the ibis, the little white-faced ibis here. And what we're going to do is we are going to make a, um, we're going to draw, we'll do a couple, a few blind contour drawings. I want you to stare at the ibis and just put your pencil on the piece of paper and follow the back of the head down. Don't look at your paper. If you look at your paper, you're cheating. And then up, flat, and down. Now, do it again. Um, just put your pencil down. Now do it again. Now this time, you only get to make straight lines. So, and so, and with, with, with corners. So where are those gonna be? So what I'm doing on mine is I'm making a series of kind of, I've got this slope of the head that comes down here to an inflection point there. So I kind of come down at an angle. I then come down from that. All right. And then I go up, flat to a corner, down. All right. So sometimes that kind of turning this into line segments, line number one, line number two, line number three, line number four, line number five, line number six. Turning curves into line segments helps you see those inflection points and capture them on your piece of paper, all right? Now, you get to take one of those that you like and you can wrap your bird around it, all right? So I'm gonna give us one minute here starting from here and we can draw the bird.
and stop. Isn't that a cute little bird? Now, by the way, if your sort of sidebar screen um, uh, that has uh, <coughs> has my, you know, you get to see my phone. Um, if, if that is blocking part of the bird, you can take that and drag that to other parts of your screen so that you are not blocking your view of the African jacana here. All right. Um, so just be aware that you can do that on Zoom. So let's start again. Pat the jacana. Everybody pat the jacana. All right. Curve little head down, one bump and flat. Okay. Little bump, sharp point, big bump, flat. Pat the bird, pat the bird several times. All right. Um, if you want, try that blind, blind contour thing. Just kind of curve your pencil around the back. All right. Now, I'm going to give you one minute with the Jacana cam. Ready? Go. And stop. So, um, practicing bird from on a computer like this is a fantastic way to bring up your speed and confidence when you are drawing. Um, it's not cheating. The nice thing is that they're not moving. When you're out in the field, of course, they are moving, some more than others. Shorebirds tend to like to spend a lot of time standing around on one foot and they'll, they'll hold still in a pose. And so starting on things that aren't moving um, is the, the easiest way to do it. And then you can build your way into drawing things that are, 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 are zipping around for you. Let's just try a couple more. On this one, see how it looks cute? Why does that look cute? What is it about this that makes it look cute? It's not interesting. It's a really cute looking bird. What cuteness is, is actually proportions. Big head means cute. When we get a big head relative to the body, so this is a relatively small bird. Right? And notice how big the head of this sanderling is compared to its body, right? That, so when you get that first line here, we've been drawing things with smaller heads. The challenge here, we're gonna block in a head. When we're getting our head in our body, those little ovals together, we're gonna to pay attention to how big that head is relative to that body. You ready? Give it a try. So.
and stop. If you've been drawing a bunch of birds with heads that are smaller, I mean larger, then you drop into one that with a big head, it's easy to make that head too small um, right off the bat. You'll tend to get used to drawing whatever are the most common things around you. I'm going to try this as one last little sort of uh, gesture sketch study here. And just notice that wonderful negative shape curving here, coming up straight and around here. Let's first look at this as curves. We have this curve coming down into here, coming up straight and then curving around here. Now let's look at it as angles. We're gonna have straight here, straight to here, little angle in here, coming up straight to probably about here, maybe an angle to here, flat and down. All right, so you could, uh, anytime you're you know, putting in straight line segments, you could do that in a lot of different ways around any curve. But just for yourself, decide where are, what points you think have the most kind of inflection, the most amount of turn at any place around that line and put your sort of change in your line segment in there. So I'm gonna encourage you to think of this line along the back also as having angles in it, all right? And um, what's gonna happen on this one is you're gonna try to, within the minute, get down the basic shape of it. And then we are going to, I'm gonna give you a little bit more time if you want to then draw more carefully on top of those. But let's take the whole first minute just kind of blocking in this bird. And you can start whenever you're ready. And John, a lot of people are asking what the name of this beautiful bird is. Oh, so this is a, a white ibis. Thank you, I um, forgot to, to mention that. That's a white ibis. In that sting. Ah, biodiversity. We, my friends, are the stewards of this biodiversity. It is up to us to make the right decisions to protect and preserve these. We're the most powerful species on this entire planet. The most greatest ability to change whole systems, even overnight. What are we going to do so that we can make responsible decisions and care for things like this ibis together? All right, so when you are ready with this bird, you can start to just sort of draw a little bit more heavily over those. I'm gonna leave this one up on here for a while for us to, to sort of play with more. But um, it's gonna be important to start by getting that basic shape. If you kind of look at your basic shape and kind of go like, ah, it doesn't feel ibisy, then you can start again. Rather than add lots of details onto a form that isn't an ibis form, that will not work. Um, one way of handling that is if there's part of your study that does work and you don't want to draw a whole new bird, um, what you can do is if, let's say you've got your, your face is working, um, then just kind of work 
work that head area in your drawing and leave the rest of it where it's kind of just not right. Just leave that sketchy, leave that alone and do another little study. You can also, you know, do a little study of a leg. And, you know, how does that, how does that look? So your drawings don't have to be portraits, complete, you know, like John James Audubon style portraits, head to toe of a bird. You can, my notebooks are filled with little bits and parts and of, 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 of critters. Wow, that is a wonderful bird. Makes me really want to go birding. Mm. I miss the outside. I miss the outside. Uh, parks opening soon near us, we hope. Let's see if we can do that in a way that will be safe for all of us. We really need to take care of each other as a community right now. All right. So now, let's take a look underneath the hood. Uh, take a look underneath the hood of, the, of one of these birds. This is a skeleton of a bird called a stilt. Um, and <laughs> you see why. All right, so this is its hip bone. That's its knee right there. That's its heel. That's the... Um, the the, the, this is the equivalent of the metatarsals, like the instep of your foot. And these are the toe bones coming out of here. So heel to instep, it's walking on its toes. That's its heel. So this isn't a backwards facing knee. It has a knee, but that knee is up against the side of its body. And because it can flex here and flex here, this bone can appear to be coming out back here or up here as this joint and this joint move around. So imagine a ball of body here, and then you put feathers on top of that, and what you're seeing sticking out is the heel. Isn't that cool? I, I, bird skeletons are wonderful, really weird to look at, but we have um, homologous structures. So it's the same sort of hip, uh, you know, here's the hip joint. This is your thigh bone. That's the femur. This is the tibia fibula fused together, little patella. On this bird, it has all those same leg bones, but what joint is this? What do you see right there? What is that? You said heel, you are correct. Here, it's just that the thigh um, bone and the uh, calf bone, so it's gonna have those, those bones, the thigh and the calf are hidden inside underneath these feathers here. Imagine the thigh bone going off the turkey down to the drumstick here. The drumstick is the, um, the calf bone of this bird and that's underneath the feathers. So you see that joint sticking out here. That's the heel coming down here. So on this bird, I would just kind of notice this distance here. Notice my heels are right there. But let's go with a bird with slightly longer legs. Oh, that, uh, by the way, that previous bird was a uh, snipe. Cute little Wilson's snipe. Here is a juvenile or not, or, or a, a chick of a stilt, All right? So imagine this bone going all the way up to here, turning and going to a th the thigh right up here. So it's got a knee right up here. You see this backwards facing joint. And now imagine this as two bones, one ending here, one bone, see this end of the bone here? This one here, that makes, as this, as this stretches across here, this joint feels a little bit boxy because you've got the end of one bone here, the end of this other bone here, and then stretched between those, it gives that kind of that boxy joint. So you're not going to go down to a sharp corner, you're going to go down to a little box. So um, very often when I am drawing in a bird leg, I'll have my bird leg 
come down, I'll go to a little box and then uh, come down from that. So there's that little box of a joint there. And this heel can bend all the way back up to here, going out to our toes, coming forward here. Wonderful moment in this photograph captured right there. Photograph by Vivek Kanzode. Um, if you want um, to check all the photographs in this um, workshop, uh, you can find on the website Bird Pixel, Bird, P I X E L, one word, Bird Pixel. Um, and um, that's a, a great source for your bird photographs. I also like seeingbirds.com for photographic reference. Seeing birds and bird pixels are two of my favorite. All right, so now let's take a look at the legs here. Oh dear, oh boy. Um, can you figure out what is going on here with this bird with one, two, three, four, how many legs does it have? Okay, there's something weird going on here, right? This is a jacana. And they've got really long toes. So this backwards facing thing here, that is what joint? And you just said ankle, and I'm really proud of you. That's good, right, that's right. So that's our ankle back here. And look at how it is, it's coming out to this little box. You can imagine one bone ending here, one bone ending here, and then we're stretching between it. That is just going to, on the inside, a little bit more of a curve, bigger on the outside, bigger on the outside, smaller on the inside, bigger on the outside, smaller on the inside. And then the chicken just has these huge toes for walking on top of lily pads. Um, very, very, very cool. But my approach when I'm drawing for legs is I want to get, especially this length here, to be correct. How far down is that heel? I mean, yeah, it's the heel joint here, the ankle. Um, part of the foot here could be uh, down in the water, but I want to get that correct. And then when we, um, when we um, are, have the leg bent, this is bending just like a normal foot. So if I, I'm going to stop this screen share for a minute and jump over to this camera. And if I bend it down. All right. <clears throat> So what a bird is doing, if you are a bird, you are walking around on your toes. So birds, if, if you're doing this at home, actually we need to kind of get up and move a little bit. So get up, everybody get up and kind of get on your toes, take your torso, tilt back here, butt out, up on your toes, right? And then as a bird, you're walking around, right, like this. So that is, that's, that's being a bird when you're doing that. So everybody be a bird. You're up on your, up on your toes like that. So this part here that is off the ground, that is fused together on the bird, right? That's that, the metatarsals all fused together and makes that long. So normally, um, so this is all covered with feathers and you're gonna see part of my lower leg sticking down. So this is all hidden with feathers where my arms are. That's all my fluff, right? And then you just see this part sitting down. Or as we saw in that snipe, the fluff was all the way down to the heel, right? So that's kind of what's going on with the homologies of the, of the bones that are in our skeleton and in all these birds. When we start thinking about beaks, it's going to be important that we look at each bird. Um, you know, some birds tilt up, some birds tilt down. Some birds' beaks are really straight with a slight little curve up, right? And the 
I tends to be more above, remember on the, the sparrows, the I was like right on that, that line, much like this guy right here, all right? So on some birds, some shorebirds, you'll see that eye line comes straight up, that the line right through the beak, and the eye is gonna sit on top of that. Other birds, like a dowager, the eye is much higher placed on the head, and it gives them this very kind of um, alert look. Um, so the, the eye gets, can be higher. So I find it's really useful to think about a line coming straight in through the line of the mouth. And then are we above that or are we right on that line? And that's gonna help you get the expression of the bird. Um, notice on a lot of these shorebirds also kind of a steep forehead. That's a very useful thing to look at. And lastly, um, on this bird here, notice that the curve, you could really think of this as coming straight out to here and then down in the last third of the beak. When you're drawing beaks, I usually use the bird's head itself, the bird's head as a measuring unit. Uh, so I think, how many heads long is your beak? All right, so this one here, kind of one and a half, all right? Um, for instance, if you're, if you're taking a look at a greater yellow legs than a, and a lesser yellow legs, the lesser yellow legs has a beak that is about the same as its head length. So this length here, if the beak ended here, right, that would be a lesser yellow legs. On the greater, it's one and a half. So I like to use that bird's head as my measuring tool for how long to draw those beaks. And that's something you can actually see out in the field. Um, you can use that little bird head and kind of look at it and kind of like, oh, head and beak, they are the same length, all right? Lesser yellow legs. Um, one and a half, oh, like it's clearly more than one, all right? I've now got a greater yellow legs, all right? And then you start looking around at things like, you know, short-billed dowagers and long-billed dowagers. Check this out. There are sh short-billed, long-billed dowagers, and there are actually long-billed, short-billed dowagers. Oh, no. So actually looking at the individual birds and seeing how long is the beak on that character that you're drawing um, is, the, is the best way to approach it. So really just pay attention to the bird, um, and it will help you get that beak to be the right length. So I like to use head lengths. I'm also looking at where that, um, where that eye is. The a general rule of thumb is that if you do lots of pecking for a living, so you're seeing the bug and then you're gonna jam your head into the bug, your beak tends to be more aligned with your eye. If you do a lot of probing around in the mud and the muck, your eye tends to be higher. So if they're kind of doing blind feeling, like a snipe does, they'll have that eye set higher in the head. But if I'm targeting and stabbing, then um, like this guy does. So the, a, a, a heron, its eye lines right up with that, with that beak, all right? And so that's, that's the formula for being a stabber. If it took its beak and kind of mucked it around in the, the dirt, I mean in the, in the mud, then the eye might be kind of up higher to kind of get it a little bit further away. You don't get as much mud in your eye, I guess. Um, that's a very useful rule of thumb for thinking about eye positions on these birds. All right. And that brings us to herons, right? And this is where we really have to get necky. We have to get necky. So we're gonna take a look at a strategy for drawing the necks. Um, some, I've seen a number of herons and egrets, but they're drawn almost as if the neck is a fire hose, as this long, sometimes curving tube coming down. There are very specific angles in bird necks and especially in when you start looking at the, the necks of 
of, of herons and egrets. So here's my approach for drawing a heron neck. And you're gonna notice that it's a little bit different. What I usually do is I start just with an anchor of putting a little oval in for my head. And then I give myself a beak. So I've got a head and I'm gonna then hang the whole neck off of this. And that's gonna start by looking at the negative space. What is the shape of the air behind, <clears throat> behind the neck? So again, I'm not looking at the egret. I'm looking at what is the shape of the air down here. And it's gonna come in, angle, it's gonna go into a little dumbbell and then out on a curve. So if I am thinking of this shape here, not as the back of a heron's neck, but as just an abstract shape, it's going to come out, then down, corner, in, little dumbbell angle, and curve. All right. Then that is the line that I block in. So I'm blocking in the negative shape. I'm not drawing this here, I'm, but I'm visualizing the yellow here to get me to draw that shape. And expect there to be rounded parts and straighter parts. So where I'm going to like, where does it make sharper curves and, 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 and more rounded curves? I used to then, here my, what my approach used to be, is I then just do the same thing. I look at the negative space here and, and draw that. The problem was that when I um, would do that, I would sometimes get either really skinny-necked egrets or really thick-necked egrets. Because when I'm drawing that line in the front, my brain, here's another kind of brain hack. Um, understanding our human cognitive load. So the idea of cognitive load is you can't handle too much in our brains at the same time. If I try to hold too much up there, things will go south, All right? So what I, what I do is I have on the, the top edge, um, uh, or, sorry, along the front edge, I will put in a few little dots just as kind of reminders and spacers saying this neck is approximately this thick, right? And so I put in a few dots, just saying in this part, I want it to be about this thick. In this part here, I want it to be about this thick, about this thick here, then thicker down here. So those are just spacers it's, I'm not going, I'm not creating a dot to dot. So I'm not going dot, 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 and then connecting those. That's actually harder than drawing lines. This is just putting in a few, you don't want to put in too many or your brain will do dot to dot. Just a few little spacers. And then I look at what is the negative space that is in the front of this? What is the shape of the negative space? Where are the curves and the angles? And I don't have to follow my dots exactly. I can sometimes miss a dot a little bit, um, but I am now drawing in that negative shape in the front of the bird. Where is it a curve? Where is it a sharp corner? Right. And that helps me be able to block in the negative shape on the front and the back. And you get these cool kind of egritty moments. And then you can draw your bird on top of that. And you get, you, you, that it's a great strategy for helping you get those kinks. Generally, what you're gonna see is on the back, more rounded, then that goes to angular. And on the front, more angular, that then goes to rounded. Angular goes to rounded. Rounded goes to angular. What's happening here is that the spine of this thing comes from back here and it connects down to this point here. So the spine goes here and then it makes a sharp turn and it's going to come up here 
and then curve down around like that. So in here and in here, those are sharp points, sharp corners that are made by that spine underneath uh, all those, those, those feathers. All right, now you get to do this too. What we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the head here. Look at that nice, see what's happening is there's the, the neck is kind of coming down to here, then the, the sorry, the neck bones are coming down to here, then over to here. That little corner there is actually where the neck bone is coming here. So this is stretched skin coming out against the bone that is then coming out across like that. It goes, you know, here, the, uh, the throat, is in front of the bones, and then they cross over right here. So the throat and the, the esophagus and the trachea are going behind the bones down in here. So right there's that crossover point, that sharp little point right there. When you get that in your drawing, you're actually showing an important structural anatomical thing about um, herons and egrets. Pretty cool, right? So let's try this. Draw a little oval for the head and a line for the beak. And then think of this as this is just a negative shape. Look, just focus on the, sh look for where it has, there's an inflection point there, that's nice. And get that negative shape in. Draw that on your piece of paper. And when you're ready, then what you're going to do is put in a few spacers. Just put a couple things in here saying, keep this thicker, uh, thinner, right? And some spacers in here just to kind of say, I want to be about this thick here. Again, you put in too many spacers and your brain will start going to dot to dot. You don't want it to do that. You want those spacers just to be helping you keep the thickness. And now you're going to draw the negative shape that's in the front paying attention to where this point is relative to what's going on the back. So put this inflection point here and this inflection point here, those are both things that you're seeing due to what's going on to the bones underneath. Let's draw that in. Not going to give you time to finish this bird, but we want to play with that, that neck trick. Again, negative shape, spacers, negative shape. The spacers have saved my bacon a bunch of times. I'm going to slightly move this bird's head and watch what happens to this angle. Watch what happens to this angle back here. Uh, where it is straight and where it is curved. Isn't that cool? Look at this. N now focus just on the negative shape. Don't see the birds. Just see this as a, as a little dumbbell shape. All right? You're going to come down. Inflection point. Straight here. Curve around here. And then, whoop, right, get this really to kind of curve in, stop. Whoops, no, no, not you. Um, stop and up. All right, let's draw this bird. Don't draw, have to draw the whole bird. But let's get that, that, that neck and head arrangement. It wasn't until I was sort of doing things like this that I really started to see the power of working with negative shapes. Hey John, after this one, can we get a little bit of a full screen demo on your document cam so people can see you do it in real time? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, 
intentionally kind of gone off my document cam view um, because I want people to be looking at the bird. I want, it's, it's important that we kind of get some practice doing this ourselves. But I'm happy to show, show me doing that. <clears throat> All right. Now I am going to go to this bird. <laughs> Right. All right. So here we go. Let's let's go to um, stop. All right. Can you currently see my screen? I mean my 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 pad, Hamer. Yep. All right. So. So on, on this one, I've got a head. And I have a curve coming back here that then comes up. And there's an inflection point right in here. I'm gonna put in some spacers. It's gonna be thin in here. It's gonna be thicker in this area. And let's see what the negative shape is doing. It's coming, there's a curve down, and then there's, there's a, a little bump. to here, then down, and from there, I'm going to keep this part pretty thick. So that's how I would kind of go about blocking in that neck. Now I'm going to jump back to that square sheet. Here's while you're doing that, I was add this up. And so you can see those, you know, angle here, angle here down to a sharp point here. Um, kind of find that that should be more angles in there. All right. Um, this should be at a slight forward angle. So yeah, there we go. Look at that negative shape there. Negative shape there, negative shape there. That's that's what really helps you carve these. So now um, I am guessing that a bunch of people have been working on drawing this one also uh, at home there. And I'm about to change this bird over. So if you haven't if you've already worked on it, kind of get in some of those last kind of corners and details, square up some of those little bits.
because stab. <laughs> this, look at what's going on with the legs. Heel, what's going on with this one? Look at this negative shape here. So here's the neck bone coming back, going forward to this corner here. So the neck bone actually comes back here. This kink in it is part of the kind of atlatl style thrusting mechanism that allows it to do the sudden thrust forward. There's muscles that kind of go across this little um, horizontal thing. So, so, th so from this corner down to this corner here. So draw, sketch that in. That is, that's a cool neck. I know I'm not giving people time to finish any of these. Again, you can find all of these photographs on birdpixel.com. And um, so just before we kind of, you know, go on, you can see that you can, even on a medium length neck bird like this, you can think about how you would look at this as a negative space with corners, negative shape with corners. We talked a little bit about legs. We talked about straightening our beak and kind of getting the inflection point. We talked about using the head as a measuring tool to get those different objects out and about how the head in proportion to the body, uh, that's, a, that's a very useful thing. Anytime you're uh, drawing and you start to kind of really beat yourself up artistically, and you start going, oh no, it doesn't look right. Just kind of change your mindset and start to add in a bunch of notes, written notes with arrows, and you can do them what kind of arrows pointing to things or these little kind of dot and line arrows. I sometimes make this a kind of curved line. It seems to not interfere with the drawing as much when I do that. Um, you'll find that when you start adding written notes into your sketches, that a lot of the heavy pressure to make capital A art, 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 will disappear. And with that pressure gone, it's, it's a lot more fun. And it's a numbers game. You want to get yourself to be able to make this drawing and the one after it and the one after it. The one that is after, the one that is after, the one that is after that, that's actually your target. That's where we're going. We got to get to there. Um, so I find that adding written notes in on any sketch allows me to get a lot more information in there. And you'll see that when you do that, a lot of the art pressure goes away. And if you can even leave those in on, on finished pieces, and you'll see that it just sort of makes things interesting. Um, you know, here, this bird, all of a sudden, you know, let's say it does this, and then it's standing there and you're going, okay, I wanna draw it, but it takes its head and it folds it down into its feathers. You could start an entirely new drawing. But something that I love to do is what I call making hydras. And what hydras are, are birds with multiple heads. And so I'll just kind of draw one bird, several heads, and that allows me often to get a lot more information down on that one sketch. So when I'm doing field sketching, this is a very useful strategy that I do a bunch. But you'll see I'll have these hydras where I can use one frame for a bunch of different poses. I'll show you rather quickly my approach to dropping in watercolor. Um, and, uh, but, the, and then we're going to take a look at some ducks. 
So when I'm putting watercolor in, I put in my shadows first. I put shadows in as sort of a purple gray mixture, looking at where the light is hitting it. So this is a backlit bird. So the light is kind of coming around the edges, back of the head here, side of the body and the legs. If you put your shadow in at the end, it tends to smudge whatever streaks and details you put in. Once I put my, sh my uh, that in, I then put in what's called the local color. And local color means that this is mostly a brownish bird. So it's mostly a brownish bird or an orangish bird. I will put in those colors. And you see how the shadow shows through? There's the shadow, there's the shadow showing through. All right, so what I'm doing is just adding another coat of paint on top of that, um, that shadow. And then I can put details on top of that. So this has streaks that are heavier on the back and finer on the head and on the belly. And I'll put in, and notice I'm testing these things off on the side here before they kind of get here. That helps me kind of figure out what color do I have and how thick is my paint. And then here is another set of bars that go across those. So I have major bars going this way, minor bars going across those. This is, erase those for a second. And you can see that there's really just, there's two just different stages, lines in one direction, lines in another direction. And you get that very complex, complicated pattern of the bird. Uh, but I'm making it easier for myself by doing one set, and then another. Um, a little bit of, this is in the evening and the, the sky is turning orange, giving you all these wonderful colors in the, uh, in the reflected in the water. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So I've just put in a coat of Orange, I like to have my bird often stick outside of the background in places. That makes, if, if, if the bird is entirely in the background, I don't know, it's just, this is, this is, well, give it a try. I think you'll find it's fun. I like doing this. And then here are some pieces of mud, some mud banks you know, around the base of the bird. And um, a few final notes turns this into real field notes. So I'm saying that this bird is uh, kind of tucking in for the night. And um, here is my location information. So that turns this from being, oh, that's a nice picture. So this is, once you get this, it's data. It's data for us as ornithologists. And the more specific you can be, the better. So as the sun sets is nice, 5 p.m. is even better. And then it took this leg and it put it into the feathers. And so I made some notes about that, that that leg folded up after 10 minutes and it was just standing on that one, one leg. All right, so you get this, you know, you've got this head, you've got this head, you've got notes about flipping around, you've got notes about movement. You see how the words really give you a greater density of information? about what you're looking at, that, that's really, really powerful. So words, pictures together, those are gonna be your friends. And then you're thinking, oh no, we don't have time for the ducks. Oh yes, we do. Because the basic ideas here are, are very, very similar to what we just looked at with a couple of little tweaks. Right? So we're going to look at how to block in the basic shape of the duck. And we'll get into some details on your duck heads, which will make ducks, geese, and swans look much more ducky, goosey, and swanny. But there's a few different places to look for proportions. So speaking of proportions, check out the difference between a cackling goose and a Canada goose. Oh, I mean, cute, not cute. Cute, not cute. So what's going on? Relative to the body, this is a big head. Look at that short neck, big head, short beak, big beak, small head, right? This is like having a large nose on a small head um, on a big body, not going to look cute. A cute little baby nose with a big head, right? That is going to look cute. So 
Cuteness, what we're looking at, when, what cute means is neonatal characteristics, the characteristics that babies have, and that's what makes things look cute. So cute is an observable phenomenon. And what it is, is basically having the features of a baby. Um, this isn't a baby, this is a full adult cackling goose. They just look cute because they have more of these neonatal characteristics. Small little beak big head in proportion to the body. So when you're looking at ducks, geese, and swans, pay attention to how cute it is. How big is that head relative to the body? How big is that beak on the head? Different species will have different lengths of beats and you can have very similar patterns, but um, your proportions are radically, radically different on these birds. All right, so here is, here's my, my duck, and I want to I want to draw the duck. Um, we're going to start the same way. So everybody, pat the duck, feel that head and that back. Pat the back of the head. Pat the back of the duck. Pat the duck. Right. That's what you want to get. And pay a lot of attention to this angle right here, where the head comes down. This one doesn't come straight down. It's got a tuck in. It's got a sharp V tuck in. So down and then back to sharp V tuck in and out then flat platform along the back, all right? Down around the back of the head, here's my sharp V tuck in, and up and along the back of the bed. So I, I, it's the same thing, pat the bird, draw the line. Pat the bird, draw the line. Now, I put in my head. Different species of ducks will have different size heads. You're drawing a buffle head or a ready duck, big head, right? Drawing a merganser. It's a small head. So proportions are gonna be, are gonna come into play here. And I'm gonna put a little placeholder for the bill as a triangle coming out flat off the bottom of that head. We're gonna see that different species of ducks will have different shaped bills, but this is my kind of quick, generic go-to, um, duck bill placeholder, not coming out from the middle of the head or it look like a gull off the bottom of the head. <clears throat> then, all right, see, off the bottom of the head. Then this negative shape right here, what is this under the throat negative shape right here? All right. And I usually, um, make this kind of get it going and I just continue it down into the water out of my sight. This critter has a body that is going to be doing something like this. Most of that I'm not going to be able to see, but I find it's very useful to visualize this as sort of a deep duck body going down. And that's going to prevent me from, this doesn't need to be, I'm just going to draw you know, over here. If you're a duck, is sitting up on, let's see, where is, ah, no, no, there we go, ah, there. So if your duck feels like it's sitting on top of the water, um, it's, that's not gonna be right. You don't want the edges of your duck to crimp in like this. Um, that's a duck that is levitating on top of the water. The water line is gonna be somewhere across the edge of that. You see how this comes down and your brain has to continue that line under here. This is coming down. It's not tucking in here right at the water line. That's coming down and disappearing under the water. So I have my water line, sort of my, my brain is continuing this duck body under the water and I'm gonna cut across that. If I'm drawing that pintail, it's gonna have that long, long, long tail sticking up the back, not attaching low, attaching fairly high on the back. And the last little bit here is this angle right here where the undertail coverts come down. That's gonna be important to get, all right? There's that. Couple last things, notice that there's kind of a puffy cheek right here. And there's this zone of flank feathers that comes across here and down like that. 
Now you're going to see on all these different ducts, it's a very useful initial element to put into your basic duct drawing. So I'm going to give my duct a little bit of a puffy cheek. And here are those flank feathers kind of coming in like that. <clears throat> so I've got those ends. And if you do that lightly, you then have the framework on top of which you draw all your ducky details. All right. And we'll get into a few of these, these details in just a moment. But notice how these details go on top of a framework that's already worked out. Oh, I also want to point out one other thing. Notice that from the head here, there's some throat before you get to the neck. Let's say the big mistake that people make on drawing their duck heads is they've got a little duck. And then the neck comes down from the base of the bill. All right? No, no, no. You want some duck throat before that comes down. You give yourself some duck throat. So duck chin, I guess I should say. You want some duck chin. Give your drawing some duck chin, and then that will set the neck back enough from the beak. I will often, when I'm sketching in the field, color notes all over it. And um, so my um, code is that I have the first and the last letter of a word. So if it has a brown head, it's B-N, all right? If it is blue, it's B-E. If it's black, it's B-K. I used to do the first two letters, B-L, but then you imagine blue and black and green and gray, right? You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between green, brown, and um, uh, so, so for between green and gray, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between black and blue. Um, or, so here's, uh, here's my, you know, BF is buff. So this gives me just a, it's a really quick shorthand. And I'll often draw this, write this directly on top of my sketch if I'm gonna be doing watercolor later on. While the duck is there in front of me, this is a great way on any sketch of recording information really, really fast. If I was doing a finished studio piece, probably wouldn't do that, but this is crazy useful for field sketching. And then, you know, the duck can move its head around. And so like our, our, our uh, shorebird did, you can get multiple heads. I'm going to stick with this one for here, but I find it's fun to, you get some of these in and the whole drawing becomes much more animated, much more interesting to see these little guys, these little heads. And here I'm just using a dull pencil to give me areas of value. And um, uh, so getting the colors is one thing, getting the darks and the lights that is, that's, that's really important. So a little shadow here above that ear bulge or that cheek bulge. Um, and you can see me developing those patterns on the back. Most of the wing is hidden by these, what are called scapular feathers. We start with smaller feathers here and feathers getting increasingly longer as they go out over the back. Covers up almost all of the wing, as well as those, those flank feathers. So here you can see those scab feathers getting longer towards the back here. Um, the blue on the beak, brown, the gray on the side of the body. This little lining, line work in here, these little kind of wormy edges, um, that is an ornithol little kind of, these wormy squiggles, vermiculation, meaning kind of worm lines. And I'm just suggesting that having these lines here be kind of thick spaces, those will show through in my sketch and give you a sense that there's some kind of line in here. But if I get in here and try to copy that 
pattern at this scale, I'll go nuts. So we talked, so there's my, my, my duck. Just to review, getting in the water line, I'm gonna look at the water line also kind of interestingly. Um, the position of the water line is relative to the speed of the duck in the water. So look at how much is here, right? Especially towards the front here. And if I speed up this uh, blue wing teal, um, the, because the propellers at the back, it, it kind of tank, it, it, it submarines the front a little bit. So you'll see, you can get different, uh, as, as, your, as your duck is going different speeds, um, you'll get different patterns um, in there, that water line. So the water line is a kind of fun thing to, to, to look for. You get a lot of information in about what's going on with your duck. So there's your water line, your tail. and your flanks. So let's draw this duck, all right? Um, on your paper, um, first let's pat the duck, pat the duck, pat the back of the duck, pat the duck, pat the duck, and um, we're going to draw it Start with, all right, don't watch me, watch your duck. I recommend drawing lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of mallards. If you're in North America, draw hundreds of mallards, if possible. The more mallards you draw, the better. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to get a general sense of mallardness in your head. And then you are going to, when you, another species of duck pops up and it looks different, you'll go like, wow, that duck has a big head. A tiny, you'll have kind of... The, the mallard can become the, the yardstick by which you measure all the other ducks. Right? And it, so it's good to have kind of a, 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 a baseline of, you know, of, of proportions, like, wow, they, you know, relative to the mallard, this is a, this is a big head. Um, let's try this one here, all right? Just give yourself a, um, Sort of first kind of pat the duck, get your duck lines down, block in this duck. This is a green winged teal. They're small ducks, so their head is proportionally large.
John, just letting you know, we're closing in on 10.45, so we should be yep. opening it up for questions pretty soon. <clears throat> I think what I'll do is just do one little thing on drawing the duck head, uh, a kind of a zoom in there, and then uh, let's draw the duck. I'll draw the duck. There you go. Nope, not yet. Let's draw a duck head. So, um, big round head, we've talked already about how the beak comes off on the bottom of it. There's that cute little duck chin. Um, so when I'm thinking about drawing these, I have a ball of a head. And then um, my little cone of a beak comes off the bottom side of that. All right. I've got a duck cheek in here. The eye sits high on top of that. Um, oh, negative shapes. I want to get that. What is the kind of the negative shape? I can get my um, duck head refined a little bit more by blocking in what are the negative shapes, especially on the forehead. Different species of ducks will have a different angle. Canvas back, for instance, has just a slope that goes all the way up like that. Redhead has a um, a steeper forehead. Big duck cheek. And from the front, you can see these wonderful duck cheeks on this, this greater scop here. Um, so the eye sits right on top of the big duck cheek. And that duck cheek, even if the head is all one color, it'll catch light in interesting ways. And it'll help you kind of sculpt what would otherwise be just a big blank head. So that eye, that duck cheek also helps the eye sit higher on the head in your drawing. A few things to notice about the beak kind of coming down here, there's a nostril. There is a little lip at the end, um, a little kind of overhang point. And right when you get close to the body, give your duck just a slight little smile up. Um, you're gonna see the edge of the upper beak is here, but right when you get to the head, it doesn't come in here. The upper beak is gonna kind of smile up slightly in here. And then you see a little bit of lower beak sticking out underneath that. So here's the canvas back with that slope head. You see the duck cheek. You see that lower beak coming up. It's a slight smile, slight smile. Same thing here, duck chin, duck cheek, nostril, tab at the end. That slight little subtle duck smile. That helps give your ducks the right expression. Otherwise they look, you know, why so serious? Um, but it kind of gives it that duck that pleasant duck look, you know that. Just charming, my friend, the duck look. So I'm going to do a real time sketch of this duck head. And um, hey, Mar, if I'm drawing where my pencil is, am I in the screen? Yep. Okay, great. So what I'm doing is, you know, if I have a basic duck head, here, my, my beak is going to be coming down. I've got negative shapes that are going to be useful to me around the back here. This one is going to come down. That's going to come down here. In the front, I have duck throat. I have my duck cheek that occupies this area, and the eye is going to sit high up here, give it a little bit of lidness. So my beak is 
gonna extend into the head, curve down around the side of the face to where my smile comes up. So there's a little bit There's the nail, a little tab at the front of my beak. I'll come down slightly and up. There's a nostril in this area here. If I am adding in value. I'm looking really where, um, where do I see um, kind of intense highlight? Where do I see uh, shadow on the head of the duck? And there is a little duck head. If I make the beak come out from the middle of the head, even if I give it a duck smile, it starts to look a little bit more, you know, seagull. So that kind of gives it that kind of that angry birds look of the of the seagull, um, but this down low with a little smile, and I've got a happy duck. So which gives us a couple of minutes for some questions. That's those are my kind of big thoughts on 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 drawing uh, waterfowl here. It's very similar strategies to when we had the songbirds. A few kind of places where we're hitting some different proportions and things. But those are our, our big ideas. Hey, Mar, as you look through the, 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 the questions there, um, are you seeing any other, um, are you seeing any other, uh, any questions that uh, you think we can address? Yeah. Um, and right before we jump into the questions, I just want to remind everyone that John is providing us all of these classes for free. And if you want to support John, you can go to johnmuirlaws.com and either buy equipment or um, his books, which will be very helpful for your drawing as well. Um, and if you want to support any of the conservation work that Audubon is doing, you can go on to audubon.org and we'll be posting links in the chat. So I have a couple of questions. Um, we've had a couple of people asking about the orientation of the birds. Um, is there a reason most of the birds are sort of facing to the left? Oh, great observation. Very, you're right. So, um, what I've found is that it's a flip in people's heads to go from drawing left facing birds to right facing birds. And if I orient all the birds in a workshop to face the same direction, they can focus on those basic skills a little bit more easily. Of course, in the field, um, some birds are going to be looking right and some birds are going to be uh, looking left. Um, and um, actually that, <laughs> my final bird, I did put one last one in that was facing the other direction. Uh, this obviously must be one from the Southern Hemisphere, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, here, um, but, but it's actually easier to learn if you just sort of start everybody kind of going one way. And then, of course, as you're drawing things in the field, you're going to draw whatever direction you go. But just for kind of getting those skills down and seeing similarities between slides, I find it is easier for people um, to to have them all facing 
one direction. So as a teaching tool, I often in, uh, in initiate these with my, all my birds facing the same direction. Okay. Um, we have a question from Hector about primary and secondary feathers. Is it similar to what we were doing in class last week or is it just different with water birds? Um, so this bird here, um, uh, actually, actually I need to, is my, my screen share, uh, can people see this? Yep. The duck? All right. Mm -hmm. um, so they have primary feathers. These are primary feathers sticking out here uh, underneath these, these scapular feathers as this bird is kind of fluffing itself around. You can see those sticking out. These feathers, when the bird is inactive, get hidden. So you're seeing some scapular feathers here. There are some tips of primary feathers sticking out, and that's all you see of the wing in this. So essentially what you're seeing is a bunch of scapulars kind of coming down to some tertials, and then the primary sticking out um, underneath that. Let's go to this duck here. You see uh, the wing. It's all breast feathers coming up here. On the back here, you've got scapular feathers and tertials covering everything up. And that is, it's all hidden. Here's mallard again. And what you're seeing is um, the back feathers called the scapulars. These are those tertial feathers. Remember the one, two, threes. And those are large and make a sort of a sheet. And underneath that, you see this little bit here. That is all you're seeing of the wing. Oh, man. So that's the primary feathers sticking out right there. On this bird, scapular feathers to some tertials and I can't, that, that's, that's some primary feathers sticking out there. Right, see what's going on is you cover all that wing up with scaps and flank feathers so that your essential flying mechanism remains tacted. So this, this is kind of cool, that little blue in there, that's actually part of the secondary coverts of the bird. Um, but that's gonna get completely hidden Here's primary coverts, there's secondary coverts. So you see it's got primaries, primary coverts. It has all those parts of the wing. They're just getting covered up. So when I am looking at the duck from the side in the water, Here's the back end of the duck. It's going to be all scapular feathers, flank feathers covering up most of this. I'm going to have some, often some big tertial feathers here. So I've got one, two, three feathers. And I might have some primary feathers sticking out there. But if you don't like drawing wings, ducks are for you. Um, and that's, it's, it's really cool to, to see that. And in this view, I can see there's a tip of some primary feathers. There's some tertials and that's it. In this drawing, all I have here, I've got tertials here. That is my primary feathers. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Yeah, okay, this is all we... spectacular feathers. We're nearly out of time. Uh, Christy is asking about the homework. Ah, thank you, Christy. All right. So, um, what I would like from everybody here, again, um, the reason I'm giving you homework is because you think, oh, that was cool. I'm going to remember that. Um, and you're... You're, you're thinking there's no way that I'm going to forget all those cool tricks that I just learned. And the next time I go out to draw ducks, those will be at my fingertips. But we want them to actually be there, but your brain is about to do a really savage assessment. It's going to say, is this critical for my survival? If so, I'm going to remember, remember it. If not, I'm going to put this all in the, the, the dustpan. 
And the next time you go out uh, sketching, you'll, your brain will have deleted most of this information. In order to get it to sync up and be something that is accessible to you, what you're gonna to want to do is to give me um, six and six. Six shorebirds, six waterfowl. And on those, block in the birds, looking at the different proportions. Do um, ducks and shorebirds with different proportions. So look for ones with different size heads, different size necks. Look for ones with cool angles, around the, the, the heads. Um, and you're going to be able to, um, to get this stuff to stick so that the next time you're out and there's a duck, there's a, there's a shorebird. You're not like, I wish I remembered what were those shorebird tricks. Right? You're gonna have like, you're gonna have a system. Right? Okay, I'm gonna pet the bird, pet the bird, pet the bird. I mean, I know I'm gonna pet the bird. And people are like, you're gonna look at you and you'll be sitting there, your binoculars, you'll be going like this. Right, and then it's going to come out on your paper. So, to get this stuff to gel, your brain, if you use this information, your brain goes like, "Oh, you're really using it. You're repeating that. Okay, we'll stick with this." All right, and it will create some new synapses to hang on to this information. But if if you just kind of go like, "Thanks, that was great," then and you kind of go on to the next thing, then your brain goes like, "Yeah, select all, delete." All right, so to get it to make those new um, synapses repetition with effort. So push yourself a little bit on this, kind of like get in there, really work on it. And that productive struggle is what is going to build the new synapses, right? And then this information is gonna be stuck in your head. The next time you use it, it's gonna be at the tip of your pencil. So six and six, six shorebirds, six different kinds of waterfowl. And please share those. What's our hashtag again, Amar? It's hashtag drawbirds2020. All right, so hashtag the little symbol, drawbirds2020. Um, let's share this on social media. Encourage your friends, teach your kids to, to, to do this. Do it together and have a lot of fun. I want to thank everybody who's been with us today for um, showing up. Um, and I also want to encourage you to look for ways that you can get involved in conservation, um, bird conservation in your area. Your local chapter of the Audubon Society is an incredible way to do that. Um, as your drawing improves, as your nature study improves, you're going to find that you're going to form this deep connection with, with nature. And to take it to the next step, to help us become stewards of the earth, and the wild things that therein dwell, right? It really helps to come together in fellowship with other stewards of nature. And your local chapter of an Audubon Society is an incredible way to do that. Um, so I want to encourage everybody to look up your local chapter. There's nature education stuff. There's programs like what we're doing here today. And you're also going to find that there are ways to get directly involved with conservation and stewardship projects, whether that is getting out there and getting your hands dirty, removing some invasives from um, the, the warbler habitat, um, or helping put the right kind of pressure on decision makers to help them make the right decisions that is going to ensure uh, biodiversity and, and, the, and preservation of the, the biological wealth of this planet for our generation, future generations, and for those organisms themselves. Um, thank you all, uh, and uh, we really hope that this workshop has been a delight for you and has, is gonna help you be able to, to do those, those sketches. Looking forward to seeing them online. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. And with that, we're out of time. So everyone, please join us back next week for how to draw raptors. Everyone's excited for that. So goodbye, everybody. See you next week. It'll be cool. I'll see you there.